Hi, everyone. I uh, work on a small team at Microsoft. We have uh, four developers building Microsoft Azure Notebooks. I'm based out of Seattle. Uh, this is the information for my Twitter, GitHub. Uh, and this talk is at the link at the bottom there, uh, if you want to get it. Uh, probably not useful to follow along, but later, if you want to find it, my username's Chris on the site. Uh, it's pretty easy to find. So I want to start by talking a bit about motivations for why we built this service and some of the basic requirements that you end up realizing you're, you're going to need. A bit of the evolution of the service, so kind of look at the history of how we got here. A high-level overview of the architecture, uh, which you're going to need to sort of understand the challenges that we encountered on the platform and how we fixed them and a few of them that we haven't quite fixed yet, uh, but there's some sticking points of trying to do something like this. So I have three user scenarios. I'm going to start with a student. So for a moment, just imagine your high school student entering your first ever Python programming class. And you have an instructor. You might be at a school that has computers. Maybe they don't. Um, I went to a really small school. Maybe you went to a big one. They're all a little different. But it doesn't really matter. You're going to start to encounter pretty much the same problems. First of all, even if your school has computers, it's highly unlikely they've given you meaningful administrator rights. You probably can't install Python. You can't install R. You can't install, well, anything. Uh, they don't want the systems to get messed up. So basically, you have a paperweight. You also might find that even if your administrators were really nice and let you do anything, that your home computer is entirely different. Maybe school is Windows and home's Mac. Maybe it's the other way around. What about from the perspective of a college professor teaching an introductory course? You have 200 students entering an intro to CS course. You're going to run into roughly the same problems. You now have 200 people who are going to expect to get help from their newest favorite IT admin, of which you probably aren't and you probably don't want to be. And so do you want to spend all of your time for the first week helping these people with varying computers set up everything about how they're going to be in your course? Or do you want to teach the course? And the last one I like to think about is that of a tech blogger. So you have a lot of blogs out there that talk about how to do something in code. Uh, and there's, there's a few different sites, you know, Code Project and such. And ultimately, what they're going to have you do is take the code they've written and try to reproduce the result. But they probably haven't really tested this on all platforms. They've tried it on their system. It worked great. They have instruction of how to make it work on their system. And even that's kind of a lie, right? It works on their system from what they understand. It doesn't know necessarily of dependencies they had in advance. And they don't really want to spend all of their time making this work everywhere. They likely wanted to show you something cool and move on to the next cool thing. They don't really draw people into their blog by showing them exact steps on how to reproduce things. So what I ended up taking away from these different scenarios and common things that you're going to need are that you just need a platform where your users can run and execute their code. That's a basic thing. That's you know, fairly solvable. You also want persisted content. Uh, this one is a little less obvious, but it's a, something that we take for granted in computing systems, that you can come back to your content and run it again later. But we shouldn't really take that for granted. So that's, that's important, too. The other thing is that none of these people are IT experts. And so because their skills aren't necessarily in administrating systems, maybe we should avoid having them do that at all. And if for a moment we don't think about our computer as being the powerful engine to run everything, but instead just a way to get to something that could run everything, we start to see that there's a way to solve these problems that doesn't rely on the host OS or the administrator rights, but relies on an external system that anyone can access. And so that's, that's where Azure Notebooks comes in. So this is the site today. You can figure out from here, this is the front page. There's some simple buttons you can click. We have user profiles. This is mine. Every user has one of these. You sign in using an AAD account. Uh, that's a Microsoft account, as you probably think about it. They might Hotmail, Gmail, Yahoo, et cetera. You can put in information about yourself, your Twitter handle. And every user has libraries. This is my libraries page. There's a few different ones in there. You can see that we have things like how many times has it been cloned. Uh, you can compare this to GitHub forking. And a library is really just a collection of notebooks. Uh, to kind of compare this to Git, this is a repository. It has your files, your IPy and Bs, and you can run this, you can share this. This particular one is written by a professor at Cambridge that we've been working with, and it's an intro to a CS course he did. So a little about history. So our project's been around for about three years. It was uh, August of 2014 when a few of our devs took a trip to, to Boston to work with some people that worked in Azure ML. 
What had originally happened is there was the Azure ML Studio, which is a platform for machine learning scientists to interactively do machine learning. So it's a drag and drop interface and you can run code and collect data sets and productize things. They wanted a way to explore data sets. And what better way to explore your data sets than with the notebook experience? So what it narrowed down to is we saw two experiences that would work. We thought of a product called Zeppelin and Jupyter. Both came up. Ultimately, we went with Jupyter. Uh, the biggest reason is that we, as a team, have a lot of expertise in Python. And so that seemed like an obvious fit. The other reason is we had contacts with Fernando and Brian of the Jupyter project. And so we had confidence that if we needed anything, they'd be there to help and that we, we knew how to kind of work in that community. We then spent some of our time for the next year to two years getting this integrated into that studio, using it. And then a lot of that time was just spent deprototyping things. We'd, we'd made this quick thing over the course of a summer, and it took a lot of time to turn that into really a production-grade service. We also realized our initial UX wasn't very good, and we started to redesign it. Uh, so this is our UX uh, around December of 2015. Uh, the date's correct. It's not 1990. And, uh, I'm a developer. I really didn't really see the problem in this. Uh, <laughs> it has everything you need. There's a problem? Exactly. I mean, there's samples and a button. What do, you, what do you need? So then we moved to 2016. This is about the time that our product really started to mature. It wasn't really a prototype anymore. And so we added some features that made it sort of feel less like a, a temporary notebook environment, which is what it was up to this point. We didn't think initially that persistence was all that important. So you guys have probably heard of things like uh, TempNB. Initially, this wasn't that different other than it integrated well with our product. And so we started adding persistence. The next thing we realized is that just persisting everyone's content in one place didn't work. We had, at that point, the users had all of their content in every time they launched a Jupyter instance, they'd have everything they've ever done. And that was terrible for organization, no one could keep track of their stuff. So we added a concept called libraries. And libraries are these you know, repositories of all your notebooks. We also added cloning of these libraries, which enabled sharing. So you could send a link to me, and I could clone it and get a copy of it, and I could play around on my own version. We also realized in this growing up phase that monitoring and alerting are important. Uh, at this point, I'd been woken up a few times in the middle of the night, and it turns out I'm really unfriendly at 2 a.m. And so we spent probably about six months with half of our team doing nothing but working on alerting and monitoring systems, logging, doing everything we could to get early notifications of failures so they wouldn't fail and we could recover. We also added R and F sharp, and we got two interns. We were fortunate, uh, we were able to get two interns for the summer, one of which worked on import features, so you could import things easily from OneDrive and Dropbox. We'd found that people uh, that work in these data science flows don't necessarily want to use curl and wget and figure that out all themselves, and so we gave them a nice drop down in Jupyter. And we also had UI rework. Uh, one of our interns, uh, he works in the Jupyter Lab project now, his name's Cameron Olson. And he brought some design expertise, which none of us clearly had from the earlier slide, and made our site look a little more proper. We also, after doing this redesign, figured out that proper UI is complicated uh, and is way harder to maintain. So we took all of it, turned it into Angular components, and brought in TypeScript, because none of us were really JavaScript developers. Uh, we spent a lot of our time in C Sharp, C++, or Python. And we found that going to TypeScript made it a lot easier for us to not well, shoot ourselves in the foot. This is what our UI looked like in September of 2016. It's a, it's a pretty big progress. This is you know, nine months later. Uh, this is actually, I grabbed this yesterday because it was in uh, Fernando's talk, which both Cameron and I were upset about uh, because he was using a year-old version of our front end to display our product to all of you. So starting in 2017 this year, we, we really started to grow up. We've added user profiles and libraries under users. I spoke about libraries and cloning, but we made another misstep. We didn't really think that people would want their libraries associated with them. That didn't occur to us that the idea of when you saw that link, you have Chris, libraries, this library. We just had library and some name. So libraries, Jupyter 2017. Now none of you can have that name. That's mine. I'm Jupyter 2017 forever. Uh, and the problem there is you couldn't sort of make a persona based on that. Uh, we also added the ability to upload and download content from Jupyter. I talked about importing earlier. We didn't really work on the ability to get it out. And it turns out we don't really want to make a walled garden. We want you to be able to come in and leave and, and vice versa as much as you want. Because the power in our system isn't locking you in. It's getting you to use it and share it with other people. So there's really no motivation on that. We also added Python 
and we worked a lot on accessibility. Uh, this is one of those cool things uh, that happens when you work at a big company. You have people that have expertise in these narrow areas. And so I was able to work with people that all they do for a living is accessibility of our products. And they, they showed us how to make that better. We were able to talk to the Jupyter team a bit and explain some things that are wrong with their product that would need to be fixed for someone that was, say, seeing impaired. And uh, that, was, that was what we did with 2017. And then this is what the site looks like today again. So let's talk a little bit about the architecture of this, now that you have an idea of where we've been and probably a rough idea of how this might work. On each library, there is a run button. When a user clicks that run button, what happens is there's a call made to the back end that says to find them a container, which results in a cascade of other things happening. The container's reserved. We have to connect you to a storage implementation for your container that connects to all the files you've been persisting for that library. We have to return that to you in the form of a link and an access cookie. That part, uh, it's a little simplified, but that's, that's basically what happens. You hit a few different services, by the end you hit three or four different things, but you get a container. And so you're in a Docker container running Jupyter. Every single time you make a Jupyter request, it goes through a proxy, and that's what the bottom part is. So you interact with Jupyter and some API call happens at a slash n slash some random ID that describes the container you're currently working in, that API call, it goes to our front end, it proxies to the VM, which hosts multiple containers, that is then proxied into the container, back out, and sends your data. And that's, that's the tight loop that happens more often than not. There's obviously a lot more APIs, but I kind of wanted to explain that before I describe the, the components that this makes up. So I think about our site as having three major breakdowns, uh, and some of them are kind of lame, but it, it's a good way to think about it anyway. There's a front end, a back end, and VMs. So the front end has two major components. One part is the website, which is all the shiny stuff that you saw, the, the blue, the black, the white text. That's what I think about as just the website. We also have that container proxy. Container proxy is a little more interesting. It's actually not much code, uh, but it, it's the thing that gets called most often, so the performance of it's important. That forwards the calls to the running container, so that way when you're interacting with some random VM in Azure, we don't have at the top bar an IP address and some port, you have this nice looking link that still looks like you're on notebooks at azure.com. The back end has a lot more components. So first of all, we have to think about service storage, which is we're gonna have to persist all of this, your user entities, all of, uh, all of the sort of metadata that comes along with when those things are created, every single library needs to have some metadata associated with it. The user data storage, which is every single library that's ever been created, we need to make sure that stays around. We have to do things like back those up because sometimes users make mistakes and they delete things and they want us to bring them back. Scaling engine. This is, this is probably the beefiest thing of our whole system in that whenever we have a, a you know, internet hug, our system has to be able to react to that and scale up in a way that allows you to not be stuck on a page waiting for a container, but to be able to get in right away. And then we also have a consistency monitor, which is more or less a thing you need in, in modern service development. Uh, we don't use a transactional database, we have multiple services, and so occasionally consistency is, is not quite there, and so we need to make things consistent again. So this runs constantly in the background, making sure our tables agree with each other. Uh, we have multiple lookup tables, so sometimes those things get out of sync. It basically just makes sure the world stays sane. On the VM side, we really have VM generation and VM management. So generation refers to the idea that we need to do Docker building, we need to build the VM for security reasons, we need to update all the PIP packages that you're going to want, your R packages you're going to want. The manager, I think, is the more interesting part. We ended up building a REST API to manage each VM. So on the front of the VM, there's a Node.js process, and it has a, a slurry of APIs that you can call to start containers, to execute code in containers, to get logs out of containers. And that, that ultimately is what we needed to talk between our backend service and the VMs that we deploy to let users run on. So now that I've given you a, a sort of a whirlwind tour of how this all goes together, what I really wanted to spend most of the time talking about is all the bad stuff that actually is going on under the covers to make this work. Uh, a few of these things we've addressed. Um, I was really hoping before this talk we'd fix all these things, which was a very optimistic uh, thing. Uh, some of them are still broken, uh, which I think is uh, basically honest. I could have cut them out, but uh, it's worth knowing about these problems. Uh, they still need to be solved. They're hard. The first one, and it, it, this, this is sort of just obvious, running a service is, is hard, and it actually costs you in weird ways that you don't necessarily consider. Uh, my team, until this point, did box software. So we'd done Python tools for Visual Studio, Node tools, um, R tools, and SDKs. 
no one was ever going to call me at two in the morning for any of those products. They had year and a half, two year release cycles. You spent a lot of time testing all at the end. And so it was, it's a different world. It was much slower. Um, so between those two things, getting woken up at two in the morning and shipping all the time, there's some funny things that happen, right? All of a sudden, shipping your product is actually real overhead. When it was a year and a half, it was a few months, every year and a half. Now it's every single week or every other day. You're spending time bashing on this or looking at this. And you start to realize that there's a few ways you need to fix this. First of all, like I said, alerting and monitoring is a, is a huge thing, along with uh, recovering your system. So if you can have alerts that can know that something is failing and take an instance out before users are affected, so maybe you can respond in the morning. If you can find ways to do your testing in an automated way so you're not spending time every week running the tests. And this, again, goes back to uh, just, in general, uh, repeatability of the testing. Right? A lot of us have flaky unit tests. Coming from a box software world to this, that impacted me in ways I never anticipated. Um, it's easily 10x the cost of a flaky test when we were in this sort of more waterfall box software world. The next thing that becomes hard about this is VM security and updating things. So we run a hostile system. We give you a container to run arbitrary code in. I don't know any of you, uh, and I don't know what you're going to do, which means I can't make assumptions that you're going to play nice which is something you can probably do if you run JupyterHub yourself. Your friends likely aren't going to try to own your system on you. But again, I don't know any of you, and at least one of you in this room is probably mean-spirited. So, <laughs> so what we have to make sure is we're always up to date. And so Linux, uh, this is not like the Microsoft hat. I'm not bashing things. There is always some new security leak. Uh, in the past year or two, there have been a few particularly bad ones. Uh, and so we're always having to watch all of the lists to make sure we're constantly the most up-to-date we can be. You also find that malicious users, as I said, are a real problem. And they don't happen often necessarily, but they do have the ability to ruin your day. And so you have to find a way to limit their privilege. So this comes from the Windows world of things. Uh, something that was said a lot in, in the org when it came to making OSs was the rule of least privilege. So if someone doesn't need to be an administrator, then they shouldn't be an administrator. And they need to be an administrator occasionally, then they should be an administrator occasionally. Not all the time, just because occasionally they might need it. That's dangerous. That's how you end up with security exploits, is by giving people privileges they aren't using. The other thing that you're gonna wanna look into is interdependencies of your own systems. So with us, this came mostly in the way of VM updates against backend updates. So our backend would end up with new methods for cloning or sharing, or um, you know, maybe a logging change. And the VM is going to have to have the other side of that communication channel. And initially, because I told you we're box software people, we, we didn't version our APIs. Um, we found out the hard way that that makes it really hard to deploy. Um, so hard that you want to do it in the middle of the night when no one's on your site and just take the thing down. Um, if you version your, your APIs, you can actually make things work with the old and with the new. And it's a little more work. Um, but I will definitely admit it's much easier if you do this up front. Don't be lazy. Um, on our new site or services, we've started just doing this by default. It took a lot more work to fix the one or two that we didn't do this with than it did to build the three next ones and when we thought about it in advance. The other thing you'll find if you host a site like this and you use VMs is that you have a lot of just sort of bogus file transfer happening. So when we put you in those containers, you're at a URL slash n slash id and everything's in the container. That's unique every time. But all the content you get with every container isn't really unique. The Jupyter UI is going to be exactly the same from time to time. So why are we serving it to you every single time? And a lot of sites, they do this. And it's, it's relatively inexpensive, right? I mean, these files aren't huge. Their icons are relatively small. You probably don't notice it, but we do. You have 1,000 connections a day, even at one meg. Well, that's a gigabyte of transfer you don't need to be doing. You, you imagine that you probably have even more than 1,000. And so this is also a problem for bandwidth-limited people, right? Where you have to consider there's plenty of people around the world that pay for their internet usage on a per megabyte basis. And so every time you send them a six meg image, uh, that actually costs them money, not just time. So what do you do? Well, what we did is we moved the content, we modified the proxy we're running. So the front end content is actually served from our front end. So it has a static address, no matter which container you're on, and it just always routes to our, uh, our front end. So this is faster for, for two reasons. One, because we don't send you content twice, which is just kind of stupid. The second reason is that there's no proxy. And while the proxy is fast, it is a hop. It does take time. 
And so this ultimately makes it faster to load the front end. The other thing is that you'll find managing user data is difficult. Uh, the way this became difficult for us more than anything is that within, I would say, three to six months of launching the site, we started to get requests to host arbitrary files. Originally, we didn't do that. We just allowed IPy and Bs, and we thought that was pretty good. And that worked for our original implementation because all of the data sets were behind an API for Azure ML. But normal, you know, everyday users, people in this room, they have CSV files, they have SQL databases, they have a large array of different data they might want, and a lot of it sits on disk. But we ran into a problem. We had made the choice to use a thing called the Contents Manager interface within Jupyter. And this is a nice thing. Jupyter is really extensible for someone building a platform like this. This is one of the many extension points. And it was a great start, but it had a limitation. And the limitation was that it was a REST API, not something on disk. And I, I feel like I've said that a few times, but Jupyter isn't just Jupyter. It's also interpreters. It's these kernels. So Python kernels are kernels. They don't understand anything about this Contents Manager. This is a Jupyter concept. It's not a kernel concept or an interpreter. And so if you go ahead and put a CSV file on this and then try to access it from within Python, Python won't find it. It doesn't know where that is. It is trying to look on your disk. So it's obvious, right? We'll just use disk storage. That's a simple answer, right? It wasn't even remotely that easy. Um, what we ended up having to do was write our own fuse driver. Uh, we wanted to get to disk-based storage. We didn't want to transfer your files every time. Again, we're back to a bunch of needless transfers. So instead, we made a network file system. And we based it on Azure Files, which is, um, for those of you that use S3, it's not entirely different than just uh, blob storage and just arbitrary container storage. But Files is nice in the fact that they've tailored the APIs to make more sense in terms of directories and files. What's also nice is they uh, provide a Samba and a CIFS mount for Linux systems. And so you can just mount it directly. But I couldn't use that either, because I mentioned earlier that at least one of you in this room is going to try to own my system. And doing that would mean giving the storage account key to someone's Azure storage account. They had made the design decision that it was OK to give a storage account key that had access to all table storage, all blob storage, um, and all queue storage for a given account. Um, and you know, you'd also just say, well, OK, just make separate accounts. Well, we have upwards of 50,000 libraries. Uh, so I need to make 50,000 accounts. Um, and I talked to the Azure team, and apparently they didn't plan for that either. They didn't figure anyone would ever want 50,000 storage accounts, and so I found a design limit. And so instead, I wrote my own Fuse driver that uses a shared access signature that I can get that is specific to a share, that I can limit permissions of you, and I can also use quotas on. So by doing it this way, we were able to quota every library at a gigabyte to avoid malicious users uh, trying to use this as some sort of file share. We are also able to then have a better understanding of what it is you're doing with file storage instead of any other thing with, uh, with some weird implementation. That's actually what we had beforehand. The uh, storage we had behind Contents Manager was uh, blob-based. And so by going to files, it, it cleaned up a lot of stuff. Um, it also meant our team got to unload some burden. Uh, and that's, that's another lesson, right? If you can use someone else's work, by all means do. Um, I know you think it's easy to, to write your own thing, but no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the next problem is, is user density. We have, at any one time on the site, um, 500 is a pretty average number of, of uh, simultaneous users. On a daily basis, we have more than that. But at any time, there's probably about 500 people using the site. So we need to get density. I can't afford 500 separate VMs. So we can use Docker. And that's what we did. We used Docker. What it allowed us to do was get about 100x density. We can put 100 of you on the same machine. We use pretty large VMs. So you, uh, you still have you know, four gigabytes per user. Uh, but I pay a lot less because they can sort of sandwich it in. Azure gives sort of bulk discount. This brings with it a new problem, though. I said I put 100 people that are possibly hostile on the same machine. And uh, that's probably a bad idea. This is what you refer to as multi-tenancy. It's fine when it's in your company and you know that your workloads aren't malicious. But it's a little worse when you don't know that. So my remediation to use to not use Docker. This is one of those fun problems where I said I don't actually have a solution for you yet. We are working on some, but I, there's nothing I can really say we haven't really fully solved it. Um, it just isn't multi-tenancy protection. Uh, this logo uh, came from the security page of Docker, which I found really funny, because they say in really bold, bold letters they're secure. Um, I feel like there needs to be the asterisk as, that says, you know, as secure as the Linux system and C groups and your you know, administration and how far you've locked on the user and if you've stripped pseudo permissions from that user. Um, then it's secure. But otherwise, our system's terrible. So 
Docker is not a security boundary. Um, this, is, this is something to sort of harp on uh, because it's really easy to think that it solves all problems, but it, it does create its own. The other challenge, which, which I also don't have a perfect solution for, is scaling out those internet hugs. So I made, a, this is a fake graph. Um, it's why there's no labels on anything. I just kind of made it to demonstrate what this problem would look like. If you look at the blue line and think about it as capacity, and orange is users, you could see that if suddenly you had a spike of users, and it took, um, in this case, three cycles, cycle being some measurement of time, to gain the VM that would give them uh, room on your system, that a sufficient ramp would mean that some people can't get on the system. Now, it turns out you can get close to making this a, a non-real problem, and we, we pretty much have, uh, but you end up having to do some funny tricks. The biggest trick is that you need to just over-provision. So we, at this point, uh, I believe our threshold today is set at 40% utilization. We start ramping up. Anytime you go over 40%, we just add another VM. It's cheaper to deal with that than to have a live site incident uh, and have users that are dissatisfied with the service. The other thing you can do that is most helpful for this is you can find any way to minimize time to provision. So we spent a lot of time trying to minimize the time between when we request a VM to when it is ready for use. But unfortunately, there's sort of a cap on that. You're starting up a, a machine. Uh, and in the case of AWS or Azure, you're also requesting physical space on a rack, usually in a specific data center, and that takes non-zero time. And so in the real world, you can't bring this to zero, which means this problem always exists. Uh, so I guess in a, in a way, we're lucky we're not so popular that this is a problem yet, uh, but I imagine that this will, will eventually hurt us. Um, there are some other solutions to this and ways around this. Um, one of the things that we have set in place to work is that if we do get so overflowed, we can add more Docker containers to existing VMs, but this effectively degrades the service for everyone. And so I don't, I don't really think about it as a solution, as a workaround, so that way we don't you know, basically have egg on our face, uh, but it's not, it's not perfect. So I don't want to end on a bunch of negative stuff. So I, I actually moved some stuff from the history to the end, so you end remembering all this. So you guys forget that I told you our site is terrible, and you remember this, all right? Uh, so I wrote this talk, or at least the proposal for the talk, in March. We had 17,000 users at the time. Um, I was pretty impressed with that, because the year before we had about 6,000, and so it's some pretty good growth. Um, but I also didn't really think that was probably sustainable. And we have about 3,500 monthly active users. What that means is in any month, we have that many people log on to our site and do something. Uh, so there's 3,500 of those. We've tripled on both of those numbers, um, which I honestly, I looked this up yesterday. I hadn't looked it up till now um, because there's a gentleman over there that gave a talk and had a bunch of these stats. And I'm like, I should, I should find what ours are um, since, so we can talk about them over coffee. Um, we also have 68,000 total libraries in our system. Some of those are clones. Some of those are original content. And one of, the, one of the sort of interesting numbers I found is that uh, since we've added file storage, which was a relatively recent add, we're up to half a gig worth of storage in a library. Um, it's a slight lie. We actually have a gigabyte library, but that's mine. Um, that's my test library. It's 0.997 gigs, though, um, which is just big enough that if I create anything else, I, I cause a failure. So that's kind of cool. Um, and it tells me I'm, I'm on a quota. So I wanted to also talk about some new features. So it turns out uh, the best way to motivate developers to do work fast is to put a conference somewhere. Uh, so in the last three weeks, uh, our team of four has worked really hard to get some features out that we've been working on for about three months. Um, and these are the big ones. There's some other things. So we added setup scripts. Some of you may have used uh, MyBinder or at least heard of it. And one of the cool things about a service like MyBinder is they realize that users want to set up their environment when they run it. And it, you, maybe you have pip installs, or maybe you just need to download some data from somewhere. Who knows? There's a lot of different things. So there's now a script. We call it the AZ NB setup script. And that will run every time you start your container. Uh, there's some fun stuff in there. So if it's a long running thing, that we let you know that. We can let you get in the container so it can run asynchronously. Uh, there's a bunch of data about this on our help page on the front of our website if you want to look into it. We also added uh, context menus. This is sort of one of those uh, accessibility things slash power user features. Over time, we added functionality, which means we added buttons, we cluttered a UI, we made it harder to figure out what to do. And so we had to keep spending time to like, try to slim those down or make it more obvious what it is you're supposed to be doing and what actions you're taking and how that, that affects things. Context menus were about fixing this and helping power users. So now when you right click on a library, you get a dropdown that allows you to clone or run or take any of the actions you need to. There's also uh, keyboard accelerators, which are the letters to the right of everything in the dropdown. So you can do this all with keyboard shortcuts. So if you're the, you know, you don't want to use the mouse type person. 
We also allow storing data in libraries. That feature uh, is three weeks old at this point. Uh, it has now been turned on right before the conference. Um, that probably made us more nervous than anything. Uh, we've always had the assumption of this REST content manager, so changing that um, was really changing uh, what you could refer to as invariable in our system. Uh, the nice thing there now is now people have CSV files, and we're starting to see uh, people take advantage of it. And the way it's mostly being taken advantage of is the last thing in this list, is that we made it easy to take your GitHub repos and bring them into our system. Before this, you can make a library, you'd have to go into the system, open a terminal, git clone, it's a lot of clicks. Uh, and if you know you're going from a git repo, we should make it easier. And so, I mean, it's not actually that fancy what we do here. It's, it's a UI where you put in your link and we're gonna clone it for you. And we're gonna put it into the, into the library and it's gonna all be there. But what this does is it brings it into a situation where you as a user don't need to go into Jupyter and the terminal to do it. You can just do it here and you could even share it right away then with you know, your coworkers, or your friends, or you know, Hacker News or Reddit or whatever. And now you've made your GitHub repo super runnable for anyone that comes along. Um, I really just wanted to finish by, by thanking a few people. Um, really, I, I do need to thank the Jupyter team. Uh, they've been infinitely helpful, uh, all the core developers and also a few of the people uh, in the community we've worked with. And a lot of the people that have worked on similar systems have been very accessible. Um, I, think it's, I think it really shows something in the community that we're all solving these problems, sometimes competitively, and we'll still talk about the ways we're fixing them and how to fix them. So it's really, at least for me, it's not important that we necessarily win, it's that we make a good experience. And if I'm constantly like trying to hide myself and you're doing the same, we can't actually come to the best solution. Um, it's kind of more of an open source thing and that's where my, my team sort of comes from. Uh, I also wanted to thank my team past and present. There's a lot of names there. Uh, not all of them still work on it. This includes interns and people that have since uh, moved on to other different projects, uh, but, but they all deserve thanks. I'm lucky I got to come here and give this talk, um, but all of them spent the time working on this. So uh, with that, I'm happy to talk about just about anything else. Um, we should have five to seven minutes left. <laughs> Uh, red shirt. <laughs> that's that's actually really funny. I wear I have a red shirt running team shirt that I made. So then, thank you for laughing at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, so two questions: Why did you go with file versus the database? Sure. And the other question is: How do you rationalize resources among these folks? Sure. Um, so I'll start with the why we went with files and not a database. So databases and large files are kind of a weird thing anyway. Most databases aren't optimized to hold arbitrary large content. Uh, they tend to do much better when the content is small. Um, we could have used SQL, it would have been a consideration, but it was an easier transition by far uh, to go to files since we were in blob storage. Um, if we play back in time, why we chose blob storage over SQL, it's kind of a more interesting question. Um, but a lot of it came down to the fact that uh, we, we chose it. I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna like make, a, make some sort of backwards architectural ideas that we kind of decided like, well, that, that makes sense. It was reasonable enough. Um, the, the hard part about uh, sort of understanding why we went with files now because of, of some shortcomings. Files would have allowed us to use, um, I said the Samba and CIFS driver. Um, we actually thought we could use it securely. Um, we didn't find out about that until we put it in the implementation and sort of started going through security passes and trying to bash against stuff and realize like, oh shoot, this would be bad. Um, and so we're, we're in contacts right now with that Azure Files team. They're planning on fixing it so I don't have to use the Fuse driver I wrote, which is totally on GitHub if any of you wanna work with weird C, Python, and C-ish wrapper code. Uh, but that was, that was that. And I forgot the second question, but I'm happy to answer it. <laughs> yeah, so um, I said right now we keep it at about 100 Docker containers per VM by default. Um, we started with round robin. Originally, we just round robin put you to VMs. The problem is that that assumes a lot of things about sort of time and when people come and go. So what we ended up doing after that was implementing a priority queue uh, that periodically, it's in theory like about every minute, but it just, it, you know, the second it's done, it starts again. Um, it walks through and it figures out utilization of every machine. So if one machine is being used by someone for like a giant TensorFlow thing, even though there's you know, only two people on it, we'll notice that and we won't put anyone else there. Um, as I said, that works, that works pretty well. The problem we ran into yet still, uh, like I said, it's actually the overutilization. Um, and not, not in terms of like one person, but it tends to be multiple people. Because when you have 200 people even doing small things, it, it kind of starts to multiply. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how we deal with it. We've, we've evolved that over time, as I said. Uh, initially, round robin worked fine, and 
Um, what, what made us notice it doesn't is uh, things like CNTK and TensorFlow uh, because they have these really, occasionally really intense workloads um, where, where someone will take everything. Uh, we, and so, so they take everything. How do we manage the resources? Well, you all get four gigs of memory, but it also turns out that not everyone uses all four gigs all the time, so it doesn't really make sense to um, you know, dedicate that to you. And so there is a possibility for you know, the memory to run on a machine, but we'll give you four gigs, and if we notice that, we won't put people there. Um, same thing goes for CPU. So we, we basically use this priority queue system. And you had your hand up? Yes, uh, so the way it works um, in, in terms of the system, um, so this is actually, um, just, just for fun reveal, you know, this is running a Jupyter Notebook. This is a server that stays around as long as there's activity. So one of the cool things we can do because we used a proxy is we can detect activity, and if we see activity go away, uh, after an hour we kill the system. So we chose a time length because sometimes you shut your laptop quick to go get coffee or, or whatever, and we don't want to immediately kill the container on you, that would be a bad experience. But that's how it works. So it is stateful. Uh, there is a time limit. If I mean, you can't keep this open for like two weeks. Um, it will eventually expire, and the problem there becomes uh, cookie expiration and some weird things that start to happen, um, but you're unlikely to find those things. Though some cool long-running tests will occasionally find some, some fun things that happen there. Um, Scott. No. <laughs> I, I'm not, nope, not, not doing that. <laughs> So the, one of the problems we, we have seen, uh, in general, this is a problem in web, is, is JavaScript hijacks. And so um, kind of a fun trivia thing, if you try to do bokeh and look at a temporary preview, you'll get a, you'll get a giant thing of JavaScript. Um, I'm only remembering this because someone filed a bug this morning about it. Um, and they're like, well, why didn't you do that? And I'm like, because if I render that JavaScript there, I have now given like the perfect platform for you to take over other people's computers. Um, so we can't do that. Um, there's stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, we're, we're lucky most of the time we tend to catch things from other people's examples. But yeah, there are, there are instances, but I don't really want to give anyone the room ideas. Um, uh, how long does it take for the VM to start up? Um, so the, the longest part of the VM startup at this point is, is Azure provisioning. So every time you ask for a VM, uh, the compute system of Azure needs to figure out where to put you. The network system needs to allocate uh, the, the virtual networking. That ranges, depending on their load, five to 10 minutes which is the real, the real kick in the pants. Uh, the the f net rest of the time is really fast. Um, for us, it varies anywhere from 30 seconds to at one point we had it up to five minutes when we sort of let things get out of hand. Um, we don't really have to do that much at startup. Really, we just need to get our proxy going and it needs to tell 100 containers to start up. And for those of you that have used Docker, that's pretty fast. Um, and so really our biggest problem is, is actually the infrastructure underlying us. Um, that's really a problem with basically every cloud platform. It's not particularly an Azure problem, it's just uh, provisioning resources is hard. Does this notebook talk to HDI? It does. Um, we had a, a hackathon a year ago with the Microsoft HDI team. Um, they do the Spark stuff for those of you that don't know their custom name. Uh, they have a kernel they wrote and it works on our system. The only reason it isn't there is we found that it, it tends to be confusing to beginner users. So to do Spark, you need to set up a bunch of config, uh, and it, it was kind of people were falling off and we were getting issues. And so rather than put that on this instance, we have elected not to. Um, the HDI team, uh, at some point, to my knowledge, is getting back to that, uh, but they're working on some other things right now. And so um, that team that manages that kernel at this point is basically one guy. Um, and so it's when he gets time to work on it. Um, so hopefully at some point he does it. I'd love to get it. Um, it's definitely a cool kernel, but as I said today, too many people click on it and then weird things start going wrong and it's really hard to communicate with them why. Is there any plan for GPU support? Um, no, the problem with GPU support, um, some of it's expense, so we actually can't do GPU right now. There may, may be in the, in the long future, but it's not really on the direct roadmap. Uh, the other problem is GPUs aren't really good at sharing. 
So GPUs tend to get assigned to workloads, and so if we have a machine with four GPUs and four users want GPUs, we're now out of GPUs. Um, it turns out CPU and memory are much more shareable, so we can get density with them. Uh, there's also weird problems with Docker and GPUs. So uh, there's just some technical problems that make that just kind of not feasible at this time. Um, so we don't, we never reconsolidate. What we do is we mark, uh, we mark VMs for deallocation. So what happens is we wait for the last user to leave and then we get rid of it. Um, the problem is you can't, you can't consistently move people around. There are cool things with Docker where you, you can do close to it, but it's not perfect. And so really users tend to disappear within, from our experience, usually within an hour of us shutting a VM down anyway. And even at the longest, it takes like a work day. And so if you wait till two in the morning of the day, it's gone. Um, it, so it's really not too expensive. Uh, 